in earlier lectures, we spoke about the terms like yarn count, yarn twist, packing density, also we mentioned yarn diameter. How is the relation among, among these often used quantities? It will be theme of today's lecture. It is nothing new. 200 years ago, Mr. Kechlin, in one French town, Milouze, presented his first model about the relation among this, uh, these uh, quantities. So we start with very old theoretical concept, concept which is roughly 200 years old. And this model is usually uh, called as a model like Kechlin. Let's accept the initial assumptions which limited our problem. Let's uh, think that we, our yarns are produced from same fibrous material, from same type of technology, and from same kind of use, or similar kind of use. I will not repeat these assumptions, but we automatically will think about uh, this limit of the arms. The Kechlin's first assumption substitute our knowledge of mechanics. We discussed earlier about the possibility how, how to calculate the relation between pressure and packing density. Uh, the fibrous material is compressed due to twist, isn't it, in the yarn. But in the time of uh, Mr. Kechlin, this relation wasn't known. So that he must to use some assumption. Uh, this assumption is, uh, uh, is here. Uh, let's imagine, let's assume that packing density is a function of twist intensity only. Is in reality packing density the function of twist intensity? Evidently yes. When I have higher twist, the twist intensity is increasing and the packing density is increasing too, it's evident. But uh, the assumption is that the packing density is the function of uh, intensity of twist only. Uh, later we will show that uh, packing density is the function, more precisely is the function of uh, intensity of twist, but also is, uh, it is a function of an other quantities. In Kechlin, mu is a function of kappa, where kappa was by the z twist intensity. You know it from our lesson one. How is the consequences of uh, Kechlin's first assumption? We will use an uh, equation known from our lesson one, based now in the form which accept the uh, first assumption of Kechlin. We derived uh, areal Kechlin's type of twist coefficient. <coughs> we called it as alpha s. It was z times s, yarn twist, times substance cross-sectional area of the yarn. And after rearranging in lesson one, it was also this expression where kappa is twist intensity and mu is packing density, isn't it? So that generally alpha is a function of two uh, variables, kappa and mu. But uh, first assumption of Kechlin say that uh, the mu is function of kappa. So that now alpha s is function of kappa only. Uh, similarly, the common, the, this areal Kechlin's type uh, of uh, twist factor is used in the theory. 
uh, in, uh, in practice, in textile practice, uh, we use some common uh, Kochlin uh, type, which is this here. Uh, this expression was derived in lesson one, two. More is here rho, uh, specific mass of fibrous material. And similarly, uh, the alpha is given by, by uh, such, uh, such equation. You can see that alpha as well as uh, alpha s as well as alpha are functions of kappa, of intensity, of twist, only. Yeah, only one variable on the right hand side of these uh, two equations. And how it is with uh, diameter multipliers? Areal diameter multiplier D, uh, D for D was Ks, and Ks was 2 by square root of pi mu. Back to our lesson 1. Well, so uh, the, uh, now, because mu is function of uh, uh, intensity of twist only, uh, Ks is a function of kappa only. And similarly, the common multiplier d uh, k, because d is k times square root of t, uh, is after such rearranging function of intensity of twist only. This work quantities are now, based on the first assumption, the function of uh, only one variable, it is kappa it is intensity of twist. The second Kechlin's assumption, which directed to suitable twist, said that the twist intensity of yarns of different fineness, different counts, shall be same. Kappa shall be constant. What is the logical root of this assumption? This logical root based on geometrical similarity. You know that when we have different geometrical objects which are <coughs> similar, means geometrically similar, then corresponding angles are same, isn't it? And uh, Kechlin thought that the yarn, some coarse yarn, some fine yarn, both will, be, will have same possibility for application, will have some similar uh, properties, especially mechanical properties, geometrical properties, when they uh, are same from point of view of geometrical similarity, are similar. Therefore, if this idea we accept as a logical root, uh, therefore, also the angle beta d, the angle of peripheral fiber in our idealized yarn, must be same in each yarn for the same use and so on. And what is it the same angle? Tangent of peripheral angle, tangent of beta d, its intensity of twist kappa, so that Kappa shall be constant. Clear. <coughs> what is now with this, uh, these four equations and the first assumption when we accept that uh, kappa is constant? Yeah. In this, in this uh, four uh, expressions, we don't know this function f but we know that it is a common function for each equation. Uh, by the way, monotone increasing function it is. It must be. So, when we use kappa is constant, then evidently alpha s, alpha, k s, as well as k, must be constant. And mu is constant too, isn't it? Yes. Uh, we said that the good idea, based on Kechlin's model, Kechlin's uh, concept, is to have the same angle 
peripheral angle of fiber because geometrical similarity in on each yarn. Nice idea. We can say to the people in spinning mill, you must measure the angle of peripheral fiber in your yarns. Oh my dear. <laughs> you can imagine what they can answer to you when you uh, give this idea to your spinning mill. Nevertheless, it is possible to solve, solve much more elegant uh, because we said that the result alpha s, alpha k s and k must be constant. So we don't need to measure the angle. We can say, for example, if for praxis in spinning mill, alpha must be constant. What's alpha? From definition, we can say from definition of alpha of um, twist factor, twist coefficient, we can say that twist is alpha by square root of yarn count, means finenis. Then we can say to, to, the, to, 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 to the working people in spinning mill, yes, you must twist each yarn. So then alpha is, I don't know what, based on your experience in uh, such spinning mill, for example, 120 meter minus power minus one kilotex power uh, one half, yeah? It's a dimension, physical dimension of alpha. This is metrical alpha. Well, uh, and when the people will produce another yarn count, then they use the same alpha and uh, using this equation, they can very easy calculate in spinning mill which of twist is necessary for this or that yarn count. Yeah? This is the first result of Kechlin's theory. The second uh, result is related to our specialist in uh, weaving technology. In weaving technology, you know, it's necessary to know the yarn diameter. Because covering, cover factors, uh, maybe covering and similar quantities which define the, the density of uh, woven fabrics and so on. Uh, how to obtain the yarn, how to obtain the yarn diameter? Kachlin's theory said it's easy. Uh, yarn diameter D is the, uh, our K, this parameter K times square root of T, yeah? And K must be constant. Diameter multiplier must be constant. For given material, given technology, and given type of use of our yarns. Well, maybe uh, based on our experiences, we can say it must be 0.039, for example. <laughs> yeah? uh, and the people can calculate it. Very easy. Very elegant theoretical model, 200 years old, but sorry, not too enough precise. It's, it's very often used because roughly it is possible to apply it. But when you want to work more precisely, then these results are not enough, enough well. Why? Uh, the practice say, practical experiences say, that uh, the, such alpha must be a little different for different groups of yarn count. So that in handbooks, textile handbooks, you can read that from count this to count this, you shall use this alpha, then from count this to count this, this interval of counts, and a little other alpha, and so on and so on. It is typical for uh, handbooks for uh, spinning praxis. Uh, this is one way. Second empirical way is to empirically change the empirically change the Kechlin's equations. On the place square root it means power to one half. It's possible for a uh, yarn twist 
to use the ratio alpha by t power to some exponent q, where q, exponent of twist, is an empirical value a little different from 0 0.5. Yeah? A lot of authors studied the problem in relation to this equation. Which of exponent is the best? Kechlin said 0 0.5, isn't it square root? Uh, then a lot of authors, a lot of authors have different ideas based on the, this or that um, experimental experiences. Well, uh, the diameter can be exp uh, empirically, the equation for a Jan parameter, uh, for a Jan diameter can be empirically uh, generalized to uh, such form d is some parameter q alpha times yan count power to some exponent times alpha power to another exponent. An example for, uh, for these values um, may be good for, for carded cotton yarns is here. Uh, w is, uh, this exponent w, it is usually something around uh, 0 0.56 in this equation and the alpha uh, the exponent by alpha <laughs> is usually minus 0 0.22 but it's uh, a little my experience is maybe another author can say another word based on type of cotton beds or type of technology based off lot <laughs> local influences yeah why, why uh, the model of Kathleen is not enough precise? His second, his second assumption is very good, and it is uh, the earlier after Kathleen experiences show that the geometrical similarity is a very good idea. It's a very good idea. What is not too good? It is the first assumption that the packing density is a function of uh, twist intensity only. Uh, Kechlin, I mentioned it, Kechlin in 1828, year 1828, had a chance to use some model with, uh, which, which uh, respect the physical relation between pressure and compression of fibers inside of the twisted of the twisted yarn. Uh, it exists some second way how to how to, uh, how to uh, solve it. This way is in my checkbook which Professor Ishtiag has and he can show you it uh, if it will be especially interesting for you. The second way is go out from some differential equation of equilibrium of radial forces inside of the yarn body and based of tools of uh, continuum mechanics solve this problem fully as a, uh, uh, as a problem of continuum mechanic. I proved it early a lot years ago. But there is a problem here. To this time, we don't know the relation between, uh, uh, between the stress tensor and strain tensor. Stress tensor and strain tensor are some, some structures very popular to say to these days we don't uh, understand enough general the relation between stress and strain in multidimensional three-dimensional case, uh, especially for fibrous assembly. Therefore, we can calculate, we can derive the differential equation, but we haven't enough well input to this equation. We must make some, some assumptions, some simplifications and so on. All this work is very, very 
difficult from point of view of uh, mathematical tools. You must save some, solve some, uh, some uh, differential equation and so on and so on and so on. Nice team. It was a lot, lot years ago, the team of my PhD thesis. <laughs> well, uh, but uh, to these days, this way is not uh, in the position to be practical tool for application. Therefore, we derived something in between, between very easy but no too precise theory of Kechlin and uh, physically the best version, differential equation of radial equilibrium solving of this one, something in between, which is easier, no so precise from the point of view of physics, but uh, better than Kechlin's type. Let's assume the known assumptions from ideal helical model. All fibers have the helical shape, all uh, helixes have common axis, which is Jan axis. All helixes have the same sense of rotation. Each fiber coil has the same height. We, we mentioned these assumptions when we analyzed the helical model. And fifth, the packing density is same in each place in the yarn. Then it's small repetition from helical model. Let's imagine some general fiber inside the yarn body. Yarn body is the, here schematically the cylinder having diameter D. Um, inside on some general radius R, this thick cylinder, thick black cylinder, is lying one fiber, red fiber, on the general radius R, helix shape. After unroll of this a cylinder, we obtain such triangle from this is from which is possible to derive tangents beta, tangents beta, which is 2 pi r z. Tangents beta is 2 pi r z, is known for you from our earlier, uh, earlier lecture. And when you open the, some handbook about the mathematics, and uh, when you find some properties of different curves, uh, you also, uh, for uh, 3D curves, space curves, uh, you, uh, you can read also what is so-called uh, uh, first curvature, also named flex flexion, is used. This uh, flexion, this, uh, this first curvature of, of uh, three-dimensional curve in, in the space, in the case of uh, helix is constant, in, uh, independent to body, uh, to points uh, on which we measure it, and it is k1 sinus beta by r. You can read it in each handbook. Uh, reciprocal value of uh, first curvature, it is radius of curvature. It is the radius of some uh, some ring, some 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 ring, which can approximate our curve in a very very theoretically infinitely small part. Yeah, you know what is it? Uh, this uh, this radius of curvature. So that the radius of curvature of such helix is r by sine square beta, isn't it? Let's think now about a fiber lying in yarn body on a cylinder, hypothetical cylinder, of course. It is not from metal, it's only our imagination. Uh, on a radius r, this is the red fiber. Uh, let's now uh, think about the elemental part of this fiber, part U, V. Yeah? This is the radius of curvature, R, K, and the angle here is differentially small 
it is angle D phi. In our fiber, let, let us, let's be uh, some axial force, capital F, axial fiber force. So when we, uh, especially this part, when we will make a picture of this part, especially here, that you can see UV, our elemental part of uh, infinitesimal small part of our fiber, on which is tangential force F, axial force in fiber. This, uh, this is the angle, this is the angle uh, phi, one half, I don't know why the, the straight line is not to see here. Uh, the, this is total angle D phi, and this is one half, and this is second half of angle D phi, so D phi by two and D phi by two, yeah? The projection of uh, force F to the vertical direction is F times, F times uh, sinus, F times sinus, d phi by 2. And we have two forces, uh, then the resulting uh, radial portion, uh, radial, uh, radial force is uh, two times F sin, sinus d phi by 2. Clear? If angle is very small, that we can write that the uh, value of sinus is same that the angle. Of course, in radians, in each theoretical work, we shall uh, calculate or think about the angles with radians. So that the sin sinus d phi by 2, it's d phi by 2 because it's elementally small. Then we obtain f times d phi. Volume of uh, such uh, a differentially small part of the fiber is which of? Uh, fiber cross section is says, so the volume of this dv, it's length of this fiber times cross section. Length of the fiber is a part of ring on the radius r, it is radius rk, of course. Radius rk, isn't it? And angle is d phi, so r, r k times d phi, it's length of fiber, times fiber cross section, it's this here. This is uh, under r k, we use r by sin square. Clear? Or no? No. Okay, once more. Uh, length of uh, part uv of fiber is which? Radius times angle. Radius is radius is R K, okay. Angle is D phi. So R K times D phi is the length U V. Now it is clear. Well, this is the length. Length times uh, R K times D phi. Length times cross section fiber cross section is volume of our red fiber segment, or elemental segment. It is, is it, isn't it? And used now on the place of RK, our earlier expression, we obtained this here. Well, I think now it is clear. Uh, let's calculate the centripetal force per unit volume of fiber. Now it's our force dp here by the volume of fiber. So dp by dv, using our equations after rearranging, we obtain that this force p1 is given by f times sinus beta by rs, where beta is given by equation tangents beta is 2 pi, two pi rz. Clear. Uh, Back to this picture. Theoretically, each fiber 
theoretically each fiber uh, compressed the material or can bring some force for compression. But uh, really it can't be too real. Uh, the fibers around the yarn surface, in reality the, the picking density and vicinity of uh, yarn surface is uh, in reality small. The fiber to fiber contacts are not so intensive. Uh, different slippage fiber is possible so that the friction is not fully um, used so that the radial force from such fibers is not too high. You can imagine it. Second, the fibers around the yarn axis, there is lot of fibers. They have a good uh, normal forces for friction. But uh, uh, the, they are near to straight line. The angle beta is very, very small. The radius of curvature is very, very high. Therefore, the radial component from such fiber is extremely small. A result, these fibers also don't influence significantly for compression of fibrous material inside the yarn. So that our, of course, this is the simplification. Significant centripetal force is present only in the green, in the green compressing zone in between the layers mentioned before. So, uh, no whole material, but only the material in some, in some green, schematically green, a green layer have significant influence to compression of fibrous material. Well, How is, um, let's, uh, the thickness of this green zone go under the symbol A. Uh, this A, uh, a radius of, uh, middle radius of this, of this green layer is called R. Yeah? So that the radii of this green layer are going from R minus A by to R plus A by 2. The uh, area of this uh, annulus, of this green annulus, is, it is shown here why, is 2 pi R A, evidently. Total volume of compressing zone, this green zone, it is VCA, uh, 2 pi R A times L. Volume, area times height. Fiber volume in compressing zone, it's total volume times mu from definition of packing density. So 2 pi r a l times mu. And the total centripetal force in compressing zone, P, it's P1 times uh, our P1 we know, V A V know 2. P1 times V A, yeah? Using these equations, after small rearranging, we obtain such equation. Our assumption for simplification is the centripetal force P acts on the cylinder at radius R. Of course, there are fibers lying on the smaller radii in our green zone, as well as some other fibers which are lying on a high radius than R, the average layer of our zone. But we make it easier and uh, we all effects uh, concentrate to some average radius, our radius R. Yeah, do you understand this, this assumption? Then, how is the area of the cylinder having uh, the surface area of the cylinder on the radius R? That is 2 pi r times l. 2 pi r times l. And how is the compressing pressure, how is the pressure which create our yarn, which compressed our yarn? 
The pressure is force by A. We calculate this A on the average re on the radius of our green zone. Yes, using our assumption, uh, our equations for P and for A. This is for P, this is for A. We obtain this after small rearranging. The pressure is given by such equation, this yellow equation. Understandable? Well, you see here some part of some fiber. Uh, in such fiber, the axial for F uh, uh, exists. <laughs> Uh, the axial component, the axial component of this, uh, better, uh, uh, the force F have the direction of fiber axis. The component of this force in direction to yarn axis is a component F A, isn't it? As axial means in the direction to yarn axis. It's evident that Fa is F times cosinus beta. Yeah? By the way, it exists also such tangential uh, force which from all fibers together give some uh, torsion moment in yarn, but it is an other song. <laughs> the, well, uh, the green sectional area of our, of our fiber, S star, is, we mentioned it uh, a lot of times earlier, it S by cosinus beta. So that the normal stress on the green area, it's normal force to green area Fa by area S star, Fa by S star. Well. Good. F times cosinus beta by S by cosinus beta when we use expressions derived earlier. So F, it is F by S times cosinus square beta. So F, the force, is sigma S by cosinus square beta. Let's rearrangement now. Our formula for pressure, this here, uh, sorry, using, the, uh, using, this, using this expression. P is possible to write also, the black symbols here are identical with our earlier equation. When I multiply and divide by S, I obtain this expression. And in brackets, what is it in brackets? No, this is, this is the normal stress sigma. Yeah? This is, so that from this equation, we can say that uh, this is sigma S by cosinus square beta. <coughs> and this is force F. Well, so we can write this equation. Tangents beta, it's 2 pi r z. Okay, we use 2 pi r z on the place of tangents beta. Now, uh, we uh, black symbols are the same. It are the same equation and are the same expression as here. Here we multiply and divide by blue d, yarn diameter. Here also we multiply and divide by green D, yarn <laughs> uh, diameter. Then pi dz is kappa, intensity of twist. So we can write this expression. And d yarn diameter here is ds by square root of mu. ds was in our lec lecture one substance diameter. Diameter of hypothetic yarn, which have not air inside of body. Yes, 
So, for pressure, we obtain now this expression, yeah? after such a rearranging. Let's continue our work with uh, rearranging. This is a repetition from a last uh, slide. We can graphically calculate, uh, write it also in this black symbols. And we multiply and divide by 4 times pi. When we do it, then this expression, when you compare it uh, with equation for alpha s in our lecture one, you can see it's alpha s square. So we can write it in such form. Last, multiply and divide. <laughs> Blue uh, diameter of fiber. We divide by uh, fiber diameter here and divide the, in denominator, it means multiply, so we can. But this here, it is square root of tau of relative count, relative finiteness of the yarn, also from lecture one. So uh, we obtain for pressure this equation this expression for, for pressure. We can call under symbol C this part, this part, and so we obtain, what is here? We obtain the formula P is C times square root of mu times alpha S square by square root of tau. What is the symbol? So sigma is the normal pressure on, on on the fiber in yarn cross section, fiber, uh, fiber area in yarn cross section. A, it is thickness of our green zone, our compressing zone. D is fiber diameter. R is a radius, average radius of our green zone. And D is yarn diameter. So we obtain this equation. Let's uh, a little discuss the quantity C. Uh, two R by D. It say the position of uh, our green zone, more precisely uh, average radius, in the in the ring of yarn cross section. We can assume that this position, this ratio, because the geometrical similarity uh, is, uh, is a constant for yarn given, of given technology, given material and so on. Well, axial stress sigma in yarn cross-section, we assume, is constant to, for example, the centrifugal force due to spinning is perhaps the same, no, the same. No, the centrifugal force, the uh, stress uh, from the centrifugal effect, yeah? So that we can, uh, we can uh, imagine that uh, also the sigma is constant. Uh, relative thickness of uh, pressing zone, it is the ratio A by D. It is difficult to explain. All experiments say that this ratio uh, shall be also constant value in the yarn. Uh, why we have some semi hypothesis for this? But often say uh, the assumption that this ratio is uh, constant is not fully uh, theoretically analyzed and uh, based at most on the experimental results. There, uh, nevertheless, we will use it. Uh, we will uh, assume that A by D is constant too. Then then hold this parameter C is some characteristic constant in the yarn. And we can write P is 
c times square root of mu times alpha s square by square root of tau, where c is some constant. Jo? Well, our, our hour is out. Uh, thank you for your attention. In the next lecture, we will show how to apply so derived pressure. This pressure is derived from geometrical uh, relations inside of the Jan structure for the Jan structure. In next lecture, we will use also our known equation for pressure from our lecture about the compressibility uh, of fibrous material. Yes, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.